can spray on if you're in uh, parts of the country where there's extended feeding. But you can still recommend uh, fall treatments and even preventative applications on trees that are showing symptoms this year to protect those trees going into 2016. We also see that with some of the flat-headed borers like bronze birch borer, two-line chestnut borer, and emerald ash borer. Uh, you can treat trees that are showing symptoms yet this fall with different treatments uh, to protect them going into subsequent years. And with the flat-headed borers, these actually fall into both uh, the categories of showing symptoms that you can make treatments to yet this year and also into uh, the category where you want to target these host species to make preventative applications for protection next year as well. Hemlock woolly adelgid, there is certainly a good opportunity to treat trees yet this fall. Hemlock woolly adelgid, given the life cycle of this particular pest, has two peaks where its populations uh, can, can escalate, one in uh, late winter, early spring, and then we also see another population spike uh, in late summer or early fall. So you can go out with different treatment options at this time of year to protect against that fall uh, population of hemlock woolly delegate. Spruce spider mite uh, is another one, uh, cool season mite, and those populations are going to start to pick up once temperatures get below 80 degrees here this fall. And so we can target applications to coincide with the life cycle stage to really be effective in managing some of those um, spider mites on conifers. There's a few different aphid species that are out there that we run into at this time of year uh, that we can still manage. And then there are a number of scales uh, that we might see signs or symptoms of that we can still manage and protect trees going into future years as well. So we're going to focus on a couple of these protocols. And I'm going to start off with spruce spider mite. I think this is a unique life cycle. And in most parts, of the country we're going to run into spruce spider mites or some types of cool season mites on different tree species as the temperatures cool down. And what's unique about these cool season mites is that they overwinter as eggs uh, in the barks, uh, in the bark cracks or in the needles of these conifer trees. And they become active early in the cool parts of the spring. And this typically, uh, depending where you're at, can be in April, uh, May, and even into early June in some areas of the country. Um, they be, they're active at temperatures below 80 degrees, as I had mentioned. And so these mites are really uh, reproducing and uh, being active when temperatures are below 80 degrees in the spring. And then as the warm temperatures in the summer start to warm up, they become less active. Now, one thing that doesn't mean that you won't find signs or symptoms of the mites at this point in time. In fact, in a lot of cases, the symptoms will show up during the warm summer months. However, because the, the mites are active at this time, this isn't a great time to be treating these uh, uh, pests. Then we see another uh, spike in activity in the fall months, starting right about now going into September and October as those temperatures cool down below 80 degrees again. Um, so we have two treatment opportunities for spruce spider mite. And one of the key aspects of diagnosing these spider mites is to look for, and they can be challenging to diagnose, uh, especially to the untrained eye. You want to look for stippling on the needles, uh, orangish red stippling uh, uh, areas where they're extracting the chlorophyll out of the needles. You can see uh, chlorosis as well right around the feeding sites. One of your best tools for diagnosing is to have a hand lens for which you can look for adults and eggs of spider mites on the needles and um, on branches. That's extremely important because you want to be able to correctly diagnose this. I think spruce spider mite can oftentimes be misdiagnosed as other problems. Another great way to diagnose and monitor for mites is to do a shake test. And this is where you take a white piece of paper, hold it under the branch, and then you're going to shake the branches to look for crawling mites. Typically, your predatory mites 
uh, or your spider mites, excuse me, are slow moving versus predatory mites, which actually are beneficials, which will feed on spider mites, are going to be fast moving. So fast moving dots are the predatory mites. Uh, the spider mites, which are the pests that you're trying to treat, are more slow moving. Um, there is some debate about doing a squish test and the coloration of the predatory versus the spider mites. If you read some extension uh, documents, they'll say that the spider mites, uh, when you squish them on your white piece of paper, will turn a certain color, sometimes green, uh, versus the other, uh, the predatory mites being a reddish color. Um, so what you try to do with this branch test is discover if there is a threat hold of mites that would require a um, miticide application to be made. And typically if you look at extension recommendations, and this is the one that we pulled right from Penn State, I thought they did a good job of outlining the steps for the branch test. More than 10 mites per branch would equal a threshold for treatment. So you want to consider treating at that time. And it's extremely important, I think, to do the branch test because if you apply a miticide, you don't want to impact the predatory mites um, and the beneficial mites if you don't have a very high population of spider mites. Those beneficials may be able to um, control the, the pest mites uh, without making any application at all. So I think it's a sound recommendation to use monitoring for your mite programs. One of the things that I see that is confused with spider mite damage is um, uh, symptoms that are caused by rhizosphere needle cast. Uh, and typically, you can see both needle cast fungi as well as spider mites on many of our spruce trees. Uh, spruce, especially Colorado blue spruce, seem to be littered uh, with spider mites, not as much uh, rhizosphera as we have on white spruce. Um, but if you've got white spruce, especially uh, Black Hill spruce, you'll notice the rhizosphera, in some cases the spider mites as well on the same plants. And it's important to educate your client about rhizosphera because the symptoms that we're seeing uh, with rhizosphera needle casts are typically showing up on the previous year's growth. And a lot of confusion is uh, had in that homeowners uh, want people to come out and treat those symptoms. When in fact, this is an excellent opportunity with this fungal fungus to go out and educate your client that the fungus is active on the new growth, even though you're seeing symptoms on last year's growth, this is a great opportunity to then recommend fungicide treatments for rhizosphera, which have to be done uh, in the spring of the year as the candles uh, are extending on the spruce when new growth is coming out. So make sure that you are diagnosing the spider mites correctly and also recognize that there may be other issues going on. If we get into specific management recommendations, um, one key product that we're seeing a lot of use out there is with our Lepitec product. And this is a soil application that can be used to manage mites. It's also commonly used as a soil applied product for caterpillars and many other leaf feeding insects. Rainbow developed the EPA label for Lepitec in 2009, and it's really taken off as a great protocol for uh, doing soil applications with mites. There isn't another soil applied formulation on the marketplace that allows you to do soil injection. So on trees that you might not be able to spray, or trees, in, in, which includes a lot of trees in urban areas, uh, you can make a soil application, uh, soil injection treatment right at the base of the tree. And we have um, a soil injection system called our HTCI 2000 that can be used that accurately doses the amount of Lepitec per injection site. And then it also uh, allows the applicator to ap uh, accurately dose the entire tree. So it has a, a digital counter on there for the individual injection site. And you're applying about 250 mils, which is about eight ounces of ready-to-use mixed solution of Lepitec right at the base of the tree within about a foot and a half of the trunk. And Lepitec is a systemic product, which means it's then absorbed by the roots of the tree and is taken up to protect the leaves and needles in the trees. The neat part about Lepitec is that it moves into the tree very quickly. In a matter of just a few days, you can protect trees very quickly. 
And that's important with uh, spruce spider mite because our research has shown that if you can time a Lepitec application to occur just prior to or at the early onset of the mite populations before they escalate, you can uh, very effectively treat uh, spruce spider mite. And there's two treatment opportunities. And again, this coincides with their peak activity in the cool part of the spring, which using growing degree days, which is this GDD there, growing degree days are the accumulation of heat units and their specific formulations that are used to calculate growing degree days. And you can get these uh, at your local extension office. Most of them track them, and a lot of states will put out nice IPM reports. Well, you can use these growing degree days to um, basically time your spray applications and some of your systemic applications so that your treatments are made at the appropriate amount of time. So we know Lepitec uh, takes 7 to 10 days uh, to move up into trees to fully protect them. So we can monitor growing degree days and back off our treatment timing by that amount of time to allow for adequate uptake and movement throughout the, the tree. We can then go in the fall and also make applications. So let's say we, we got out and we noticed symptoms or we were too late maybe in the, in the spring of the year to make our applications. We didn't get them on the schedule. Well, we can come back and make an, a recommendation to the homeowner to treat with Lepitec in the fall of the year as well. And in some cases, uh, arborist companies uh, will, if there's extremely high populations of spruce spider mite, uh, they may make an application in both the spring and the fall, especially in that first year until, they've can, uh, until they knock back the populations to the point where they can come back uh, and monitor in the next year and uh, maybe back that off to one treatment. The one uh, aspect of Lepitec that you need to be aware of is that it has a shorter residual compared to some of the other soil applied products, so it will last in the tree only for about 30 to 45 days. So with some pests that have a longer feeding period, you're going to need to make a repeat application. There are spray treatments for spruce spider mite as well. There's a lot of different miticides that can be used. Uh, Lucid is a great formulation for spider mites. Um, it works not only against spruce spider mite, but it also works against another category of mites called the eriophyid mites. Um, and it can be applied, again, coinciding with growing degree days, trying to target the, uh, the early populations before they really build up in the tree. And we can also time our treatments to occur with phenological indicators. For example, in mid-May to early June, when PGM rhododendrons are in bloom, we know also that coincides with uh, our spruce spider mite population starting to become active, and so we can time our treatments based on that as well. Horticultural oil can also be considered uh, to, uh, for treatments as dormant oils uh, to control overwintering eggs. Um, the one thing you want to be aware of is that on blue spruce, uh, the horticultural oil can take the blue coloration out of blue spruce. And so we don't oftentimes recommend using the higher rates of oil on conifer trees, especially spruce. Um, so we want to be careful about that. Okay, so let's now look at, uh, here's a data slide just showing uh, the treatment effects of Lepitec soil injection, and this was made uh, in early June of 2008. This was a trial that Dan Herms did at Ohio State University, and you can see that Lepitec performed uh, just as well uh, as Lucid combined with a horticultural oil as an adjuvant and Forbid, which are two common miticides. Um, and a one-time application of Lepitec uh, really knocked back the mite populations. So let's move on to the next pest here, which is bronze birch borer. Uh, bronze birch borer is a flat-headed borer, and it's a native borer that attacks uh, birch trees here in the United States. The bronze birch borer is a, a pest that 
pretty much can be found throughout most of the country, and it targets our non-native or exotic birch species. Himalayan birch, uh, some of the European Asian birch species are really like candy for bronze birch borer. They're very susceptible to attack to bronze birch borer. Um, you'll oftentimes see uh, birch trees, especially in residential areas, uh, in urban areas, they're planted like this birch tree here in the photo in very dry areas. People will put them on berms and birch like nice, cool, wet soil. And so it really predisposes these birch trees to attack by uh, bronze birch borer. And in some cases, and we've seen this here locally in the Twin Cities, if bronze birch borer populations are very high, they can even attack some of our native birch species like river birch, which uh, typically are not as susceptible. But when planted in these types of locations, this is a property southern exposure. You can see the turf is real crispy and dry here. Uh, there's no mulch uh, or very limited mulch right at the base of that tree. And you can see some of the uh, top on this birch tree already thinning and starting to die back due to bronze birch borer. Bronze birch borer, and I'll talk about this later and at the end of the talk, is a native wood borer that's attacking exotic uh, birch trees. And it's opportunistic, so it thrives on weakened or stressed trees. Typically, that coincides with drought, soil compaction, perennially dry areas, uh, construction injury, and other uh, diseases and insects um, that are stressing them as well. And it's important to recognize that with some of these native borers because not only should we be recommending our insecticide treatments to directly combat uh, bronze birch borer and the pest I have here, two-line chestnut, but we should also be recommending different things that we can do to enhance the health of trees as well. So we'll talk about a similar insect here, and I'm going to group their management um, recommendations together because their life cycles are almost identical. Another flat-headed borer, two-line chestnut borer, uh, it got its name because it did indeed attack chestnut trees. Um, but as we know, most of the chestnuts have been uh, killed due to uh, uh, fungal pathogen. Um, so its primary host of, of any market significance is the oak trees and again, trees that are susceptible after drought, and especially construction injury in urban areas. I've noticed that um, two-line chestnut borer can come in and attack these trees in areas where we have oak wilt, uh, bur oak blight, or some of these other pathogens that um, also weaken trees, uh, especially oak wilt on the white oak families, like your bur oaks, uh, your white oaks where oak wilt doesn't kill the trees outright as quickly as it does with the red oaks, those trees can be much more susceptible than to two-line chestnut borer. So you want to consider that in your management strategies. Oftentimes, the symptoms of two-line chestnut borer, you're going to have this layering effect of healthy leaves layered with uh, symptomatic leaves in these areas, especially in the upper crown initially where the two-line chestnut borer are feeding. Of course, the larvae are feeding under the bark, uh, creating serpentine galleries. These larvae are very similar to emerald ash borer um, as flat-headed uh, borers, and they're going to be frass-packed. Um, and uh, those adults, as they emerge, both for bronze birch borer and two-line chestnut borer, are going to have that very diagnostic D-shaped exit hole. Management options for bronze birch borer. So if you're out, you're seeing symptoms at this time of year, and, and really this is a great as you get into August and September, especially in areas where you have drought stress, it really makes the symptoms from uh, these two insect pests very pronounced. So you can come out and work with your clients to recommend uh, treatments to those uh, symptomatic trees. We've got a couple different options. We can do at this time of year, we can make uh, Zytec applications, soil drench or soil injection applications to these trees to prevent future attack in 2016. Uh, we could recommend next spring that they use Dinotefuron, TransTech as a treatment. And then we have a couple of different tree injection uh, recommendations that we can make uh, with either imidacloprid or imamectin benzoate 
I uh, apologize about that spelling error on the mmectin benzoate. So we have a few different options uh, as far as treatment this year. The imidacloprid and the emamectin benzoate treatments can still be made. Uh, TransTech would be a spring application for next year. Now, as far as symptomatic trees, it's important to recognize, and we've seen this, I think, and have learned a lot more about where the cutoff is as far as the degree or level of symptoms that you're seeing in trees uh, from damage from these flat-headed borers. And our experience over the years with service with our service company here in the Twin Cities and with companies across the country with two-line chestnut borer and bronze birch borer is that our greatest likelihood for success is if we can catch the symptoms um, up in the canopy and showing less than 30% of the tree uh, showing symptoms. Once you get above that, uh, saving the tree is much more difficult and you certainly want to take into consideration uh, if there's dead wood in the tree, you're going to have to do some dead wooding and what the aesthetics or the functional uh, appearance of the tree will be even after you try to protect it. Uh, the other key factor as far as an expectation, if you're going out making fall applications uh, with some of these systemic treatments, remember that a lot of the larval damage and damage has already been done this year and that's going to, in a lot of cases, it could make the symptoms worse going into next year. Um, so it's going to take one or two seasons uh, at least for these trees to stabilize and recover from bronze birch borer or two-line chestnut borer. We also want to consider different cultural management uh, practices. I think just mulching our oaks and birch trees, uh, proper irrigation is also important, um, and doing anything that we can do to reduce or uh, remediate construction injury as well. Things like uh, using the air spade and root system enhancement uh, on these types of three, uh, trees is a great practice to make uh, in combination with your insecticide treatments. So let's look at um, preventative treatments that we can make to healthy or non-symptomatic trees at this time of year. And really I've grouped the insect pests into this category because there's many common insects that can be treated now in the fall that we can prevent future attacks. These trees may not be showing symptoms, uh, but as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there's a risk or a likelihood that they could be attacked. Uh, um, and there's a number of insects that we can target for these. Furthermore, we know that, again, while we can make applications in the spring of the year, that can be an extremely busy time for us operationally. Um, it's tough for us to get out and meet with all the clients that we would like to. And so getting an application made this fall can reduce some of that spring workload uh, going into next year. It can be a nice uh, revenue source for you going into the winter months where for a lot of companies it can be uh, leaner. The name of the game, I think, with these fall PHC uh, services is to s extend out the time in which you're able to do some of these more profitable, higher return on investment services. And the further you can extend that in, out into the season, uh, the more uh, you can improve your bottom line and also serve your client. So emerald ash borer certainly is a, a very devastating insect. It's a flat-headed borer. Again, it has a very similar life cycle to that of bronze birch borer, two-line chestnut borer. These are trees from a research trial that we did in Hazelcrest, Illinois, uh, showing just a graveyard of dead ash trees along the median. This was just a beautiful landscape and, and uh, green canopy here prior to emerald ash borer. But what I wanted to show you here um, is just to dispel any myths that these insecticide treatments uh, are not effective. You have the tree here on the left-hand side of the picture that has been treated uh, this is a treatment uh, that's been with emamectin benzoate um, multiple times over this uh, six-year trial and following the uh, appropriate recommendations, dosage rates, and treatment timing, you can see very high levels of protection even under the heaviest pressure for emerald ash borer. So this isn't a tree that you, you probably aren't going to find this scenario for emerald ash borer. We'll
a healthy appearing green ash tree like this. I, I just wanted to bring this up so that you understand that treatments can be effective in managing EAB. The scenario more that you'll run into is more in preventative situations where EAB pressure isn't as high, say you're within uh, 15 miles of the nearest EAB infestation and you want to consider doing a uh, preventative treatment. Uh, this is those are great. This is a great time of the year to go out um, and treat trees preventatively that are uh, within a certain uh, within 15 miles, as I had mentioned, that are still healthy appearing. So we can make our preventative applications again with Zytec. We can recommend Transtec for next spring, or we can sit, consider the tree injection treatments of uh, imidacloprid and amamectin benzoate um, as well. Um, systemic bark sprays of Transtec also uh, can be targeted in the spring of the year as well. So you have a number of different options for EAB, and depending on the scenario, um, again, emerald ash borer could be something that you could sell and make a treatment now for with the imidacloprid as a soil drench or soil injection with Zytec, um, or for those of you using imamectin benzoate, you can still make applications yet this fall prior to leaf drop with the tree injection treatment. Uh, or you can prescribe the Transtec uh, for spring and early summer of 2016. I wanted to just show you an EAB treatment timing slide and really uh, this I think points out if the time of year we're in August right now and so you have the two options Zytec and Amamectin Benzoate that you can go out and make applications right now with and the reason you can do this with Zytec is because it has a long enough soil half-life so that you can apply it this year and you can go out and make applications starting in September and apply, excuse me, apply Zytec until the ground is frozen. And we've seen in our research trials in Toledo, Ohio, that Zytec applications can be made in November and provide uh, very effective control in the fall for emerald ash borer, um, especially on trees that are 20, 25 inches and less. Um, and so you can really extend out the treatment duration and treat late into the fall with Zytec as a soil application. It's a very high return on uh, your, your man hours uh, when you're using this treatment. Very operationally efficient. You can treat trees in just a few minutes or less uh, very quickly. And Zytec is a good broad spectrum insecticide that you can use for a lot of other pests uh, for making treatments at this time of the year. And you can also then do um, imamectin benzoate tree injection treatments uh, made to the root flares. Here we recommend that you apply this prior to leaf drop so that you have the full complement of leaves that are transpiring and taking up the tree injection formulation so you get even uniform distribution throughout the tree. And then contrasting with what we talked about on Transtech where this is more of your spring treatments. So if we look at um, the concept of using Zytec later into the fall months, October, even in November, and some parts of the country you can make applications even later than that uh, for areas where the soil doesn't freeze, there's a number of different insect pests that you can treat for this fall that will provide protection against uh, in, in the next subsequent years. Things like uh, some of the plant bugs, lace bugs, adelgids, aphids, some of the different sucking, piercing insects that are either feeding in the phloem tissue uh, or the xylem tissue. Works on a lot of the defoliating and chewing insects, leaf beetles like sawflies, leaf miners, and Japanese beetle. And then we've already talked about its effectiveness, um, especially as a preventative treatment on the flat-headed borers. And there's a number of these insect pests that are attacking trees very early in the spring of the year. And it can make it challenging not only uh, from an operation standpoint to get out and treat these trees in time, but also if you look at some of our products, something like Zytec, you can't uh, go out and make a treatment um, in some years where you have a late winter, uh, late snowfall, uh, and allow enough time for the product to be absorbed and to move up into the tree 
Um, typically, Zytec takes 30 days or more, especially in larger trees, to be absorbed by the roots and move up in the tree. So for some of these early spring feeding insects, Zytec can be a challenge to get predictable results and achieve a high level of control. So some of those are birch leaf miner. Uh, we have plant bugs that feed uh, very early in the season as the new growth is coming out, both on honey locust and on ash. Sawfly can be a challenge, again, if, especially with the late winter, to get the treatments on. In a lot of, lot of cases, it seems like, uh, especially in the last few years here, winter seems to uh, end very abruptly, and all of a sudden we're into 70, 80 degree days, and we get all of the insects developing very quickly. So it can limit your management options based on how long it takes for some of these systemic products to move up into the tree or plant. White pine weevil is another one uh, where Zytec fall applications have so shown in research trials to work very effectively against this pest. And this is one that begins to uh, attack trees very early in the spring. And we've seen failures from spring insecticides because the products cannot move up into the pines uh, very quickly. Oftentimes with uh, our spruce or white pine, um, you're going to see notice symptoms where that terminal lead uh, is dying back and typically those symptoms are going to show up at this time of year so it's great uh, education to talk about that with your clients and then recommend uh, a, uh, a treatment to try to correct that uh, and probably more importantly treating trees adjacent or near uh, the infested trees preventatively to prevent attack on them. Once that terminal lead is attacked and destroyed on some of these conifer species, it can impact the form and oftentimes it might be better for you to uh, call that tree and uh, work preventatively to manage the other surrounding trees. So if we get into the third category now, prescribing treatments uh, to clients, you know, you run into problems, symptoms that you're seeing at this time of year, uh, but they're really because of the pest life cycle or because there isn't any uh, science-based treatment recommendations, you can't really do anything to manage it at this point in time. And this is the case for a lot of our foliar diseases, uh, uh, apple scab, anthracnose, uh, and other uh, foliar diseases that there, there's limited options for you to manage them at this point in time. And so we want to make sure that we're providing recommendations uh, where we're timing the, our treatments um, accordingly. So some of the symptoms that you're going to see with insects or signs of insects that you really want to stress with clients to manage the following spring are going to be a lot of the caterpillars. These populations can be fairly predictable, although they will ebb and flow, and caterpillar populations tend to have cyclical cycles. But things like bagworms, we're seeing the bags at this time of the year, on a lot of different species, those are great targets to educate your client to treat them then the following uh, spring and early summer. Uh, there's a number of, of leaf feeding caterpillars, gypsy moth, winter moth, canker worms, things like that where you saw symptoms either throughout the summer months or you're still seeing symptoms now and you can go out and manage those very effectively next spring. Another one that we're getting a lot of questions on are some of the oak galls, gouty oak gall and horned oak gall. Certainly seeing symptoms of those at this time of year, but we found that um, you need to target the leaf feeding stage of these um, pests to, to have any uh, chance at controlling these uh, gall pests. Here's some research showing um, Lepitec again, very good uh, protocol for caterpillars. You can go out in um, late May, early June and make soil injection applications to bagworms. This is on honey locust from Dr. Frederick Miller's trial in Illinois. You can see here that we started to uh, observe uh, efficacy uh, July 25th, which was about uh, five weeks, uh, six weeks after the initial treatment was made and that continued into uh, the season against bagworm. 
On gouty oak gall, we've done a, a few different trials on this pest. Gouty and horned oak galls, certainly getting a lot of questions on these pests. These have very complex multi-year life cycles, and so we wanted to look to see if there was any systemic products that we could apply to manage uh, these two pests. Uh, spray timing can be very difficult and challenging to, to time these treatments because they have short feeding windows in the spring of the year. And so applications made um, in, in late May, early June again with Lepitec, which moves very quickly up into the leaves and accumulates at high levels in leaf tissues, um, provided actually very promising results on swamp white oaks. Now these were smaller swamp white oaks and um, when we replicated this trial on larger trees, trees that were greater than 20 inches, we didn't see, see the same level of control. We certainly saw better control uh, than the untreated trees. Uh, and so I think there's some promise here. We have um, our management recommendations with these. If you're using Lepitec, we'll recommend to clients that they're going to have to treat for at least two, if not three, seasons before they start to see trees reverse and stabilize uh, because of their multi-year life cycle and because the, the galls are so prevalent, it can take a couple of years for the new growth of the trees to come out and for the, for the galls to be uh, completely controlled. But again, seeing better performance on smaller trees versus on the larger trees, but it does give us something that at least we can recommend uh, for gouty and also horned oak gall. Recognize there's a lot of oak gall species out there that can be caused by insects, mites, uh, viruses, fungal organisms. So it's important to properly diagnose um, the gall insect, which can be quite challenging. Uh, but for these two, gouty and horned oak gall, we've had some decent results, at least for arborists to consider for a treatment. I just wanted to touch on um, these spring recommendations that you're prescribing, um, you know, in cases where uh, you don't have the ability to use soil applied Zytec because it takes longer to get into the tree, you can use TransTech in the spring. I think TransTech is a great spring protocol because it moves so quickly into the trees and can provide protection. Um, there's recommendations and research out there that shows that when trees are quickly transpiring in the spring, these systemic products um, like TransTech can move in very rapidly. Um, if you compare the uptake and translocation speed of TransTech to a midacloprid, it cuts down uh, your time in half. So where I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it can take 30 to 60 days for a midacloprid to move up into the tree to effectively uh, protect the tree. It can take half that time, two to four weeks uh, or less for TransTech. So these early spring insects or summer insects here, just because you don't get out and make a fall application this fall, you still do have options next spring. Uh, maybe your client doesn't want to uh, move forward with the fall treatment. You can get out and for most of these pests, go out and make an application of TransTech. And TransTech actually works great too going out at this time of the year to treat hemlock woolly adelgid. So that's one uh, problem that you can still treat this year with TransTech. Um, here you can see the uptake speed of TransTech. This was on sycamores. And just seven days after application, we have very high levels of dinotephiron, which is the active ingredient in TransTech, up in these sycamore trees. And that continues uh, to certainly be at high enough levels, 30, 60, and even 120 days after. You can see it starts to drop off after about 60 to 120 days, uh, whereas imidacloprid, which is represented in the yellow bars, starts to climb in its uh, parts per million per leaf. We talked about TransTech. It, it does not overwinter. It doesn't have a long enough residual to overwinter. And so fall applications, unless you're treating things like uh, conifers or hemlocks where the insecticide is archived in leaves or needles, um, it's not going to uh, be archived to provide protection next year in deciduous trees. The uh, neat part about TransTech too is it's real good in IPM programs where um, you monitor and are seeing 
initial stages of pest pressure, you can go in there and quickly make an application of TransTech and, and it'll move up into the tree much more quickly. TransTech comes in water-soluble packets, uh, which reduce exposure to the applicator. Um, we have all of the dosing information that you need um, in our protocols and uh, for the specific insects. If you want more information on that, um, you can contact us, but there's the dosage rates. We won't get into that in a lot of detail here. So I wanted to, to finish by just discussing the impacts of some of the abiotic stresses like drought and compacted soil and other issues that we uh, find often in urban areas that can impact the health of trees. And I thought this was a, a great picture taken here, right here in uh, Minnetonka. This uh, shows the difference in ash trees on the right that were irrigated throughout the growing season versus ash trees on the left in these vacant commercial properties that were, were not irrigated. And this was taken in August. And so it's not like this is, uh, you can see the ones on the right are not putting out any fall color. They've got nice full canopies. But this certainly has an impact on these ash trees and can weaken them and predispose them to certain insects and um, uh, diseases. And the point here is um, not specific to ash, but in general where we have these weakened trees, certainly we can um, have a much higher likelihood for attack, especially by our native borer species. So native species prefer stress plants. So we talked about that and we saw that with two-line chestnut borer and bronze birch borer. Um, in their attempts to infest healthy trees in some cases, um, these, these borers, these wood borers and other insects may not be as successful um, in attacking healthy trees. And that's really because of the coevolutionary history of our native uh, wood borers with the native species. And you see relationships like bronze birch borer and river River birch, um, where they've co-evolved, and so the river birch have developed some defense um, uh, chemicals or, or um, basically ways that they can defend off some of these native borers. Uh, sometimes they produce uh, phenolics and tannins and, and different fluids to push out some of these borers. With pine bark beetles, with Ips species, we typically uh, can see uh, different uh, fluids and resins being uh, used to push out some of these bark beetles as they attack. The opposite exists for exotic wood borers like emerald ash borer. Even on this property here, emerald ash borer, what we see at low pep, uh, pest populations, they have, may have a preference for attacking stress trees, but as populations build with emerald ash borer, they're going to attack healthy trees, small trees, large trees. It really doesn't matter to them. That's because our native ash species haven't developed any coevolutionary history to be able to defend off or ward off the animal ash borer. <clears throat> Here's a list of the native versus non-native borers. Um, you see that pine bark beetle, bronze birch borer, and two-line chestnut borer are some of the natives, and these other ones on here are invasive pests with their host species. Just to kind of um, take that into consideration um, as your management. When you're managing these native borers on native host species, doing things to improve the tree's health is very important as part of your overall management strategy. So these stress trees are attacked more because they have lower sap volumes, uh, uh, you know, they have less starch reserves, or they have to use more of those starch reserves to ward off these insects, and they have less energy to spend on defense compounds. So doing things to keep our trees as healthy as possible in urban areas, properly irrigating with soaker hoses, allowing them to, uh, to use water more efficiently by enhancing the root system with air spades, um, going in and decompacting soils, creating a soil, uh, suitable soil environment for root growth and development, uh, mulching with two to four inches of organic mulch, whether it's wood chips, um, as far out to the drip line and beyond if you can helps to retain moisture and also create a, a soil environment for root growth and development. Um, using tree growth management tools like Canvastat to improve the drought tolerance, 
increase fine root production and, and provide some of the other benefits and increase chlorophyll that can improve tree health. And the nice part about Canvastat is that just like Zytec, you can go out and make a Canvastat application until soils freeze yet this fall. And so it's a great business opportunity and also a great way to begin the process of um, incorporating this in as a protocol as an overall strategy to help manage uh, the health of trees to not only better withstand insects, uh, but just to be more healthy and vigorous overall. Canvasat has been widely used now for over uh, 15 years to, by arborists for managing and treating tree decline. And this is a great photo of uh, Gary Watson that illustrates the use of Canvasat, but we also combine this with radial trenching uh, where we went in and um, uh, amended the soil and also reduced the compaction at the base of this white tree, uh, white oak tree. And you can see that this tree recovered very nicely over a 12-year period of time um, to improve its health. And that tree is going to be certainly less susceptible to two-line chestnut borer um, and some of the other insects and diseases like anthracnose. So just to conclude here, hopefully you've learned uh, some of the value of late season insect management recommendations for your client and can walk away now feeling confident in making some of those um, prescriptions to your customers. Hopefully you identified some of the key insect pests that can still be treated this year uh, or that can be recommended for treatment next year, both trees showing symptoms as well as trees that can be treated preventatively. Hopefully you learn a little bit about the management options and how tree health ties into the susceptibility of insect attacks in ways that you can reduce stress. One thing I wanted to bring your attention to, we have 15 different uh, fall field days that will allow arborists to really get their hands on and learn more about some of the management strategies. We're going to be focusing in on uh, the use of the air spade to do root system enhancements and then also be training arborists in on um, some of these different fall protocols that we discuss here today. So you get your hands on the equipment, uh, you can come out and meet with the arborologists and territory arborists in your area and get to see um, in person some of these hands-on demonstrations and learn more. These are free events that are half-day events that include CEU credits and you can see the different locations uh, where these are occurring throughout the country. Um, so I'd encourage you to go to our website, learn more about that, and you can register online or contact um, our customer service uh, solution center at the 1-800 number that you see at the below of the screen here. One other thing I want to bring your attention to, there is a fall, uh, late summer, early fall opportunity guide that you can use that goes over. It's a great reference piece. It lists all of the different fall services that you can apply and some of the different key problems uh, for the trees and goes over some of the concepts that we talked about today in some of the previous webinars. And uh, you can request this uh, by sending a short email to info at treecarescience.com. I'm always available via email or you can contact me. My cell phone number is uh, available for you if you need any tech support questions or if you'd like to chat about any of the concepts from this webinar or learn about any other uh, rainbow solutions that we can have and work with you on. With that, I want to say thank you for your attention and time. It was great having you today. And um, I will look to see if there's any questions now at this point in time. Here's a question on the uh, properties of TransTech and why it doesn't allow applicators to go out in the fall and make applications with TransTech. Well, TransTech is a great insecticide. Uh, it doesn't have the same half-life uh, as a in the soil. So you can't go out and make a fall application 
and achieve protection the following spring. Uh, furthermore, it doesn't bind as tightly to organic matter. And so you want to be careful in making applications and try to target the applications more when those trees are actively transpiring and taking up the, the active ingredient in the spring of the year. Versus with Zytec, you can make your applications in the fall due to the half-life and the residual time in which um, it's in the soil. And those, the roots will draw in that product over time. Another question around white pine weevil, is this pest becoming more prevalent um, in parts of the country? I guess that's a good question. Um, what I've seen in reports from some of the extension research scientists, especially in parts like Ohio, other parts of the country, white pine weevil is becoming much more of a problem and more prevalent in the last probably five to seven, eight years, I guess. Um, I, I, we still don't run into that very often in Minnesota, um, but as you get into you know latitudes that are a little further south, like in the Chicago markets, Ohio around the Columbus, uh, and, and southern Ohio areas probably more so, uh, you start to see white pine weevil showing up a little bit more. I'd be interested if anybody else has comments on that as well, if, if white pine weevil is more prevalent, less prevalent, or the same uh, over the last decade or so. Okay, uh, one last question here is in regards to the HTI 2000. Do you have to use that when making soil injection treatments with uh, Transtech, Lepitech, or Zytech? No, you can actually use, there's a variety of different soil injection equipments on the market that can be used for applying these products. Some companies have their hydraulic uh, soil injection probes that hook up to their tanks. You can, you can hook the HTI up to a hydraulic pump tank system that's truck mounted as well. But the nice part about the HTI is that it um, allows you to accurately dose with a very high precision how much product you're applying per injection site. And then because it has a counter on there, a digital counter, it actually tallies the number of injection sites per tree. And we have our application guides that uh, specific ones for the HTI. So for a lot of our protocols, um, it very easily spells out how many total injection sites you need and your mix volumes uh, for the HTI. But you can use other soil injection systems and you just have to calibrate them to apply the appropriate amount of dose and uh, water that you're looking to apply um, to the tree per injection site and, and for the tree in total. So, Okay, uh, let's see here. So those are the questions that I have um, in front of me here. If you have additional questions, and I know we're at time, oh, a little bit over time here too, I can respond via email to any additional questions that pop up here, but I'll stay on for another few minutes if, if you have additional questions that you want to put out there. So, With that, thank you for your time today, and uh, good luck uh, finishing the year strong, and um, take care.